Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, joined by my main man, Donzilla. And once again, joining us tonight is legendary Daredevil writer Dan Chichester. Guys, how's it going tonight? It'd be, it be good. Thank you guys for having me back. It was fun thanks last time. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Make it fun this time. Back. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for coming back, man. I'm glad that you're back, and we'll just jump right into it, I guess. Good weekend. It was a good, week uh, good weekend to read some Daredevil. And tonight yes. we are talking about Daredevil, Tree of Knowledge, which took place over Daredevil's 326 to 332, written by... Dan himself, uh, mm -hmm. except the interlude with art done by Scott McDaniel. And Absolutely. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Dan, give me the inspiration behind Tree of Knowledge. You had done Fall from Grace, which was the big revamp of Daredevil in 1993. Yep. Yep. When did, do you remember the seeds that helped plant the tree of Tree of, of, tree knowledge? of knowledge? How long have you been working on that line, Tom? That was a good one. See what um, ten seconds. About 10 seconds. <laughs> My interest at that time. Um, and they've continued, but they were, I was especially interested in everything that was going on in the world of digital, which was super raw at that point, but, but it was in was, its infancy it yep. took beyond before its infancy, maybe, you know, yeah. you yeah. couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't find the, the bookstore section. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was the sort of stuff where, you know, magazines like wired and, and, um, uh, uh, you know, were, were, were coming into their own and they were very raw and they were talking about what was happening. And I don't even know if Silicon Valley was, you know, the term at that point, but I was all over this stuff. This was, this was, uh, very intriguing to me. And, and as I was thinking about, um, what did I want to do with Daredevil that would allow us to tell interesting stories, but wouldn't just continue to repeat things. It would be, be really easy to fall back into just doing some more in-city uh, street crime stories, you know, that type of thing. And I said, what are some things that we could do that could play out some new ideas? And there was a quote that I, I came across by uh, William Gibson, uh, who was the, the author of Neuromancer. He's the guy who coined the term cyberpunk, I'm pretty sure. And, um, and there was this quote that he said, which is the street finds its own uses for things, which is, you know, the idea that while these things might be developed for whatever street, the street and hackers and raw people, you know, would, would ultimately start to do their own things of self-interest. And so I said, well, that's a different type of street than people are used to with daredevil, but is there a place where we can play street level things going on? with a hacker like Sinclair Spectrum or, or things like that, and also how those could affect things in a bigger way. So we could bring in, you know, some big superhero action and the type of uh, almost, if not world shaking, certainly city shaking events that could be really interesting for Daredevil. And I thought it'd be a really unique spin. And I started to collect all these notes as I always did when I worked on these things. And I had this list of all these great, you know, words, you know, bitmap and techno spike and steel collar. Like these were phrases, right? These were yeah. terms used to describe things um, or, or, and, and there weren't characters at that point, but this was all the stuff I'm like collecting and what's a mud or, you know, multi-user dungeon and all this stuff. And as, as in a lot of the, these things, sometimes I think the, the best stuff I worked on, um, it ultimately it just starts to kind of coalesce. And it starts to kind of come together and it felt like this was a natural way to sort of get into something different, especially as Murdoch and Daredevil were adopting a more street identity, right? With the Jack Batlin character. Well, what's the street he's going to encounter? Is it just going to be a street that feels like it could be in a Martin Scorsese mean streets, or is it a, a unique street that we could play with, you know, here? And I decided uh, rightly or wrongly you know, <laughs> to play this out and, and, you know, I, I was I was delighted that so much of it felt like it it uh, it was hitting on uh, those ideas and then leading to some interesting themes and even debates within the characters, you know, within the story itself. 
Now, when Tree of Knowledge came in, did you always have that idea of it being immediately after Fall from Grace? Like when you were doing Fall from Grace, it was like, okay, this is the like you just said, this is the direction I want to take Murdoch and the Batlin character. Um, no, I mean, we knew we knew that that, that Murdoch would become Batlin, and that that there'd be you know a transition to him having to be this character, but it wouldn't probably have been until. Um, you know, midway through Fall from Grace as that was kind of coming together that I really started to think about, well, what is that world he's going to be in? And then that's yeah. when all those collected pieces, which I'm, I was collecting just out of interest and just, this is going to my reference file, this is going to my reference file, this is going here, you know, that suddenly it seemed like, well, wait a minute, why don't I, maybe that's this, maybe there's a home for this over in Daredevil. You know, and, and then you have to test those things out, right? You have to start to feel, does it, does it make sense? Or are you trying to, you know, shove something into this storyline and this character's world that doesn't that doesn't gel? But I it's thought that one of the, it's definitely one of the most unique takes on Daredevil. Yeah, and I, I would have I would have continued to pursue it. I mean, that was certainly the intent was that those would be flavors of things that we continue to play with that street level technology, um, not not up here technology, but what is the street yeah. doing with technology? Um, that could have been a really interesting thing to play with. Um, and, you know, creating all those crazy characters. I mean, M Ralph Macchio, who was the, the editor, was a great guy, but he was the biggest Luddite, or, you know, no interest in technology at all. When they were bringing, <laughs> when they were bringing word processors and Macs into the, uh, into the editorial offices, he wanted no part of it. I think he even resisted his assistant having one, <laughs> you know, didn't want it on his side of the office. But he was, I remember so super intrigued by system crash you know he he couldn't say enough about how unusual these characters were and you know how he was interested in what they were about and what they were doing which was an encouragement to me to want to go further um and, and i thought they were you know we, we did a lot of work designing them and bringing them to life it, it's a little bit of i don't think they've ever shown up again which is weird they were actually like a pretty robust group um it had a pretty they had a pretty big debut like the big splash at the end and yeah, a, a part yeah. one and and i could have seen i could have seen myself playing with them some more um if i had had more opportunities um but i'm just surprised you, you know that nobody's ever glommed onto them and done something yeah exactly it's a great it's a good yeah. it's a great shot <laughs> With special thanks to Carl Potts, did he assist in drawing that, or no? You know, I, I, I was, I was when I was reading rereading it for this. I was trying to remember what Carl had had. Carl probably brought some editorial thoughts to it. You know, Carl was always great for you're eighty percent of the way there. Tighten the screws here, and you're you're going to get here. Or you think that makes sense, but it doesn't. <laughs> and so he was always a good foil, um, even on things that he wasn't the direct editor on uh, to, to sort of run some things by. So I can see um, probably having gone to him with some aspects of the story and him, I can't remember what those are exactly, but I could see him, you know, twisting, uh, putting, putting the right kind of uh, storytelling editorial pressure to it, even though he wasn't the editor Yeah, and then, you know, making it better in that way. The picture that Dunzilla just showed when I was rereading it, I was just like, Man, that that you know that, that's pretty '90s right there. That's I'm not saying it's like a dated '90s, but you mean you mean the, the 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 group shot and sort of like we're here we're here to <laughs> yeah, do some business. We're yeah. here to we're here to take names in New York City. It's it's All a right. very yeah. Well, you know, it was a '90s story, so there was definitely, definitely rhythms. Of, uh, somebody once accused me of like naming uh, uh, of like coming up with titles that that Steven Seagal wished he'd come up with. You know, so that was, a, <laughs> which, which I took as a, you know, I took as a, a, a nice thing. So it's very, very that's nice. A that's, it was that's a compliment, a compliment yeah. right there. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah. Absolutely. The thing it's I just like too bad you didn't have page is like, it shows them like towering over the city. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's exactly. The city, like skyline right here. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that, that once you perfect. see that, you know shit's going down. <laughs> yeah, and that was perfect. I mean, in finding even the detail there, right? Because that was based on that that Robert Moses model, which I which at one point was an actual model. I think it might still exist wherever it was in New York City. So you know, again, goes into the clip file. What are you going to do with this? You know, nothing right now. But then suddenly you've got a situation where you want to 
you know, create a visual where characters are planning something against all of New York, you know, why not use something like that? So that's why it's always great to to collect things because you don't really know sometimes exactly where they're gonna they're gonna come together. But ultimately they do. I just I just thought that that was cool. The and the carrot kilobyte, that was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were yeah, they were an interesting twisted bunch. And uh, <laughs> but they had heart. So most of them had heart, you know. They had them. heart. Now I got to ask, what was it like writing you? You had written Captain America a little bit. Had you ever dabbled with Cap? Um, did did Blood and Glory come before or after? Yeah. This? I can't remember. So That's I mean, that I, Punisher, the Punisher, the Punisher, angle. yeah, the Punisher Captain America team up. So I'm trying to think, I, I would say it came before this. So yep. uh, so if that's the case, then I had done a lot of Cap. I mean, because that that's a pretty big story and and a and a yeah. pretty big deal and. And um, so I and, you know, once you write Cap, uh, I feel like I feel like uh, Paul Rudd and like, you know, Ant-Man. Yeah, we call him Cap. Uh, you know, it's sort of like <laughs> um, you, you probably fall in love with the character. And and certainly Mark Grunwald, who we were talking about before, did a phenomenal Captain America. And great, then great. that was also a place to sort of draw inspiration from. So uh, I. I always enjoyed the character still enjoy the character uh you know love what they've done in the movies and 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 such so uh, looking for a place where oh i can i can i can bring bring him in here and and he was also perfect for the story you, you know it, and i think a couple perfect. of the guest, guest stars in here might have been a little a little bit of a stretch but cap wasn't a guest star cap was meant to to be that foil yeah. to to discuss like some of the the implications of this technology, you know, you know, not not technology for oh look, I got a new iPhone 13, but what is it going to mean for people? Like, there's a couple of scenes in there that I, I'll pat myself on the back of of being very prescient in terms of setting up what are digital rights going to be and what's it going to mean when technology screws up our lives and and um, and look, it all happened, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of things that you discussed about happened in this story. But there was one scene in particular with Cap, and you have it as Cap as the perfect foil, but there's one, you know, you said you give yourself a pat on the back. There was one, I'll give you a pat on the back for the whole story, but there was one Cap scene that you had, and I forget, I'm trying to breeze through the issues looking for it, with Black just... Widow. Yeah. That was perfect. Yeah, good, good. Perfect, absolutely perfect take on Captain America. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, he was, he was, you know, once you got in the vibe of, of, that's the big thing, right? You get in the vibe of these characters, you get in their heads and, and when they have so many things you can draw from, and if you believe in them, I think, then they start to, to take you along in the story. And I think yeah. that's, that's, that's what happened there. I didn't feel like, oh, I'm putting words in the mouth of a character. I, and then they challenge you if you try to do stuff <laughs> that they don't want to do or that they shouldn't do. And, and that's where you. You, you realize, well, he's going to interpret this differently than Daredevil is. And and Daredevil was tricky at that point, too, to write, because there was also places where, while I was had to be true to Murdoch and Daredevil, I also had to have him do and say and act in certain ways purposely so that no one he wouldn't, would think like, he wouldn't, he wouldn't think he was the, the old Daredevil, right? Yeah. And like in the in the 326, he pulls the gun out. The exactly. Guy. The gun was the, the gun was a nice... I, yeah, I thought that was a nice, nice touch. That was, great, that was a great touch. Now, you were working with Scotty. Was Scott McDaniel a big collaborator with you in regards to telling the story? I know you guys kind of get co-lead on the credits, but were, were you just like, hey, Scott, you know, if you draw it like this with the words, it'll come perfect? Or was it just, were you guys kind of like, I'm writing you drawing? Not saying it's no, mechanical no, or no. robotic I mean, like that. But no, you guys had a good collaborative. Absolutely. And, and, um, no, and that's why I wrote the credits as you know co-credits because I yeah. you know I wrote the credits I could have written whatever I wanted I guess <laughs> and, and Ralph would have had final say but uh, you know I truly did believe especially after Fall from Grace that these were our stories um, and and you know we would talk about what was going to happen I, I think I was probably this is a storyline I think you know I want to I want to pursue. Um, and then we would talk about what's going to go on and there's going to be these type of characters. We're going to create a new villain set. Um, 
so I probably drove the story, let's say the plot overall more mm -hmm. in that way. But uh, th there was always a lot of collaboration in terms of here's a visual suggestion, you know, like standing over the city. You know, I might have described that, you know, done in terms of how it is, but Scott would bring it, you know, to life. I mean, I put a lot of detail into my plots. I wish I still had some of them, but they all died in the hard drive crash of 2001. Um, <laughs> but I, I, um, Stop war. <laughs> it's, it's, it, damn man, back, back up. Like I always tell people. Um, but I, um, uh, but there was always latitude. And by that point I had so much rhythm going with Scott. It, it was, it was in my mind's eye. I kind of knew what he was going to do. And if he did something different, which he would, it was better. Right. There wasn't, there wasn't a challenge. Mm -hmm of oh geez i wanted it this way you know if he suddenly opened up and took it in that direction because some people i think challenge the plot then write the this the dialogue afterwards version of of writing comics like i think most people nowadays probably write the full script at like a movie script almost yeah but when you worked with the right artist and scott was definitely the right artist or one of the right artists um sometimes you get stuff back that is such a surprise it changes your approach to the dialogue you know you might have a whole sequence of things in your head that you're going to write when i get this back and write the word balloons and the, and the captions and then it comes back and 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 it's like oh wait it, it, this is completely i'm inspired in a completely different way and what was going to be three word balloons is one word or or vice versa you know it might open up that you want to enrich it with something else because the visuals have taken you into a new place. So he, he was terrific to sort of, Oh, wow. Look what you did there. You know? Um, yeah. He, he has such a unique take on daredevil. And as we said, when we spoke last time, his art style just changes almost. Yeah. Yeah. But for each respective story. And I think on this one, the, yeah, it really is done. I mean, that, that's, fluid. that's, that's the biggest thing about uh, Scott. I've always, enjoyed especially as he found his him himself you know he found his style and i think what began on fall from grace which was still brash and rough you know became was becoming more refined it was in this. and that root that that fluidity is is again what really makes this character and this costume you know work especially and then that's again the reason it probably didn't work as well with many other people um the, his art style has a very Ridley Scott Blade Runner feel, and to my eye, I don't mm -hmm. know. There's so many like that dark image, the shadow film noir is almost mm -hmm. the shadows, and you know, I mean, even one of the sky, the cities of the that's very Blade Runner. To yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. When he's getting into the the, the city model and stuff, yeah. There's yeah. there's a starkness, you know, to to um, you know, to some of the things he's doing there, and and his use of shadow and and sometimes the the blacks you know, bringing out mm -hmm. the features, you know, on, on like Strucker's face and things like that. Sometimes it's almost their shapes and, and the shapes, you know, create an impression more than. Yeah. Like the line, their the features. Book. Right. You know, yeah. yeah line features. drawing stuff. It now what was it like Joe Casada's art? Cause he uses a lot of shadow and dark. Yeah. Makes it, makes Very. the lighter part stand out more. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's the great thing when artists explore that. Um, and, and it, and it, it shows the ver the variety and the effect that the comic visuals can have and the impression, you know, everyone thinks it's, oh, it's just either simple lines or it's over rendered line work, but these kind of things can create really unique beats. Yeah. I think, I think his art is just amazing. Now in regards to the, the, the length of the story, was it always, it was supposed to be five parts, but it ended up being stretched to seven. Was that because of, a lot of plot in the story or was it like <laughs> i don't remember man um it seems like it's the exactly right length uh, maybe that was part of the interlude story too or, you know or what the hell went on with that i don't know yeah because right it starts off at the beginning right it's like a, a story in five parts and then it becomes seven you know it probably was um uh you know just as we got into it that uh we were having a good time and and the story was getting bigger because i certainly knew the beats of it i think kind of going into it um but as as we started to kind of maybe enrich it maybe i asked ralph you know can i run this a couple more issues and 
and he was like, "Yeah, you got you got a monthly schedule. Do whatever you want, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and and go with it there." So I'm not quite sure. I wish I had a better steel trap memory for those kind of things, but I don't know why. But I'm glad it did. I could have. I see. You know, really would have suffered if somebody had said, "No, you got to end it at this issue." You know, and 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 we would have been hard pressed to kind of uh, uh, you know pull out all the tricks that we did. And you had a lot of leeway with there. They didn't really like tell you you got to do this or. I, I was I was so fortunate in many aspects of my writing career, but I worked with great people. I worked with great editors for the most part, and um, and uh, Ralph was uh, was just a dream. You know, he was. Did we lose him? I think we lost him again. I think we lost him. His video was getting a little choppy. I was trying to yeah. see if there was something on my end. I think we've lost Dan Chichester, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we get back to him, I just want to say real quick, this broadcast was brought to you by Tasty at Tuesdays. Check out all her Facebook posts on all her tasty, delicious dishes and still dead illustrations. Uh, check her out. Check out her Facebook page. I'll share it on our link. In regards to her artwork, it's amazing. She's going to help design the Bad for Your Health t-shirts. I don't know how. I'm going to try something, Dunzilla. So we've lost Dan Chichester. Technical difficulty. Dunzilla, talk for a minute. I'm going to try to get him back. I may have to slip out for a second. The show is yours, Dunzilla. Oh, great. Nothing like pressure. <laughs> you still there? Nope, you're gone. Well, until we get them back, uh, I just want to make one point. Oh, there you are. I'm back. Okay. How's that? Uh, what do you got? Oh, I'm just going to make a point on the uh, Captain America scene that we were talking about earlier. What is that? Uh, just the uh, just the wording that Dan used. You know, Cap's all by himself in a room, and he's just like leaning over, thinking about what's going on. And yeah, he says, "Men faced men on the battlefield, black and white, good and evil. Now battles begun to fought with disembodied screens and keyboards. The world just isn't as simple as it used to be. I mean, that's I think we feel like that all the time, all the time, <laughs> all the time. And I thought that was perfect." Yeah. So clearly Cap's out of his element right there. He's like, well, you know, oh, shit, what do I do, you know? Maybe was maybe, the, maybe this is the price of, uh, you know, doing these things. I have to be kicked off at least once per uh, show. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, sorry, guys. I don't know what, what happened there. So Don't worry about it. Live, live, live. Facebook exactly. Live, live Facebook time. And live either, either, with it. Keep Dunn it there. Was actually, Dunn was <laughs> paying you a compliment in regards to your words of choice in the Captain America scene about how men fought men on battlefields and now they're fighting each other behind plastic keyboards. And yep. we were just singing your praises on that. Thank you, Dunn. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. that was, it was, there was a lot of, you know, obviously I was drawing from a lot of information sources and people who were better brains than I am thinking about this stuff. But I think that's all, I mean, certainly now that's where a lot of things have gone as well. Yeah, I was, I was just telling Tom, it's like, sometimes we feel like that. Like, we're just out of our element with all this modern technology crap going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. just totally lost. <laughs> yeah, for as totally much as it empowers things or makes things like this possible, right? You know, yeah. the three of us would never be talking, you know, in this way or being able to do a show like this or this type of stuff. It does become this strange, you know, alien, you know, thing. It is because we would, yeah. like you said, we'd never get, we would never get a chance to talk to somebody who was prominent or is prominent in any form of art form unless we got to a convention. And then at that point yeah. you only get the person for like two minutes. And yeah, you exactly. Come. And then you're, and then you're, yeah. And then you're on from there. And if you want to do something with them, then you have to reschedule. Well, can we get together and I'll bring a video camera. And I mean, I remember years ago uh, uh, being interviewed by some uh, group from a college, you know, and they met me at a convention and they said, can we get together? And then you had to figure out time afterwards and how are you going to do it? But now they, somebody would just whip out the cell phone and right, and then yeah, click the make, button and say go. <laughs> exactly, and then you're yeah, you got you got a movie studio in your pocket, which is great yeah. there. Yeah, that's how I reached out to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you did. I was sitting right next to him when we did that. <laughs> I'm gonna hit send. What's gonna happen? It's gonna be I an idiot. I told you, yeah, just push you the know? button. 
<laughs> that, that's exactly what Dunn said. Dunn said, press the button. I'm like, <laughs> what can go wrong? Yeah. Dang. So what what was originally five issues just started at seven, and, and you had said the reception within the Marvel office was like, just run with it. Just keep going. Yeah. You know, like, and you were, before, I, I guess I, I got cut off, um, you know, I was just saying, I had a lot of latitude, right? You know, there was no, there was no committees. There was no, I mean, on different titles, I worked on, I mentioned the Midnight Sun stuff before. There was, there were, there, those were more group books, right? You know, you, you had to coordinate with other writers more and the editor uh, uh, over those books was trying to kind of build a world of her own, like her own world of titles. And so, and they were trying to elevate the Midnight Suns as a, as an, as an entity, but, you know, within the Daredevil office, we were Daredevil. And we got to play with the other toys. Just and, Daredevil, though, kind of. Daredevil was always exclusive. like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Daredevil had been kind of kicked to the curb a little bit by Marvel. I don't know if we talked about this last time, but we might have touched on it. You know, they, they sure, weren't giving him a, a lot true. of love unless it was Frank Miller. Yep. Um, but what we had done with with Fall from Grace is we'd gotten a lot of attention on Daredevil. And, and suddenly the PR guys and other people were interested in what was going on. And the thing that I was working on with Scott and Ralph and Pat Gary, he was a big part of the, the conversations. He was the assistant, you know, was we were actually planning almost like a daredevil universe. You know, we had several daredevil mini series and titles in mind and, and, and in development kind of to, to do more with daredevil than just the of, monthly one time. Of them was a, one of them was a time travel story, if I yeah, remember. Yeah, the time right. travel one was one of my favorite ideas, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. It was going to, Paul Ryan was going to be the artist on it, a great artist who passed away f a few years ago. And yep. um, and it was, uh, it was, it was going to throw Daredevil back in time to uh, the time period where uh, eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, where the city was essentially run by a, a a very Wilson Fisk real life character called Boss Tweed, and so the corruption of the city was driven by this character. But we were going to throw Daredevil back then, give him the Boss Tweed character as a kind of a kingpin like object. But to me, one of the most interesting things that I I thought would be fun to play with was here's this guy who is who is invested in the city knows every sound and smell and taste of New York of 1990, whatever you throw him back to 1890, whatever, <laughs> when the rivers were like soaked with blood from the slaughterhouses and, and God knows what else I would have had to research, but how cool would that have been to take awesome. this guy who was basically, you know, who is, who is, who is senses personified. And then you're going to like, <laughs> You know, you're going to you're going to smack him upside the head and say, you've got to relearn your whole world, figure out where you are, you know, confront all those situations, certainly make another costume. Right. Because <laughs> now we would have had to make the steampunk or, you know, 1890 version of of Daredevils. What would he Which look would like? Have been there? Awesome. Would, would have been awesome. Thought. Would have been awesome. Would have been cool. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I had the whole time travel. At least I had the whole had. How is he going to get back worked out? I wasn't. I didn't know how I was going to get him back from 1890s, but I knew how I was going to get him into the 1890s. But um, how was that going to work? If you can, um, well, there had been an there had been an incident, a real life incident, in at one point during World War II or a little bit before there, where this like military plane had actually collided with the uh, with the Empire State Building and mm -hmm. it had knocked a chunk out of the Empire State Building. But the Empire State Building's like built like like brick, so I think the the, yeah. the plane got much more damaged. But, you know, debris fell to the streets and such. So I had the, the plane in my story was going to hit the Baxter building and it was going to knock out some of Reed Richards, you know, equipment to the street below. And, of course, Daredevil was going to show up to help with the cleanup and the damage control and whatever. Damage control. And in the in the in the instance of being exposed to some, you know, Reed Richards magic technology. And and I'm sure there were other incidents in there, but you know that was that was going to be the the catalyst for either instantly transporting him back in time, or I'm pretty sure I had something in mind where it was almost like a a radiation effect, where it was kind of like going to build up, like he'd start to 
experience time jumps and then finally probably by the end of the first issue or something you know land fully in in the 1890s and being what the hell is this you know that that would have been really cool and that was yeah. you had all these mini series yeah. planned up were any of them considered for maybe in the monthly to maybe establish no, we, we were what we were, the, the plan what we even had like a, a corner box you know like a like that we were designing that was like going to be like if you saw this on the book you knew it was like part of the daredevil like new york city type of thing yeah um but the idea was that daredevil would always be the, the main daredevil, daredevil title would always be the the anchor and that we would have at least one to two mini series <laughs> always going so that daredevil had always had a bigger stage you know so that was that was the and it, uh, i would start um because i was greedy but uh, <laughs> but but then you know there was an opportunity for more than just me and i'm sure there would have been more than just me um uh, just to kind of keep it going but we were really trying to build on the on the momentum that we had started to say we love this character people clearly dig this character when he's given a chance to to, to do new and different things so let's give him more prominence you know with these type of uh things would the time travel if, if i can jog your memory would, would it have been all terminator would he have gone all michael bean <laughs> like naked or would it or would he have like gone with a tattered suit <laughs> yeah, i don't know i definitely the suit would have been tattered i mean because yeah. we, we had to we had to have have a reason to get a new suit i, I remember that i remember talking to paul about that a little bit um but uh uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it was like, you know, only <laughs> organic objects can travel through time, but. Uh... Still one of the, still one of the funniest time travel explanations I ever heard. Oh yeah. 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 So it can show off like Arnold, like in the, in the buff, you know, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, Arnold just stood up and it was, it was just like. Exactly. And that's when he was still massive, you know, like he was just, he was in transition between uh, Conan size and, uh, and ordinary size, which is still enormous 80, i call it 80s arnold 80s arnold yeah. <laughs> 80s arnold now now going back to tree of knowledge you we we've talked about it briefly a couple of times the interlude how much creative did, did when jeff wright came in and wrote it were you just like jeff this is this is the direction i wanted to go or would like to go um well greg wright you know he was he was greg wright, I'm sorry, uh, I'm no worries um honestly tom i wish i could remember more and, and he hasn't you know he must be it's passover weekend so he may be um he may be uh, indisposed, but um, uh, I would. I'm. I know I would have had conversations with him, right? Greg was one, yeah. is one of my best friends, so there's no way it was like a, a shock to me that he was working on it, or, or um, you know, that he just went and ran and came up with whatever he wanted. So it was definitely. It would have definitely been a baton to, uh, pass, you know, yeah. and and a lot of kind of conversation back and forth about what's going on and what did you mean by this and and you know what's that maybe even what's that technology do or or something like that um but um i can't man it's such a weird weird thing to have that gap in my own brain maybe i just lost my mind and they that's why he had to come in uh, <laughs> you know but that's, it's that's one of the it, reasons why i actually dig tree of knowledge because it has like that little wrinkle in it you know it's just yeah it's making... and i wish i could i wish i i just don't have the recollection like i do about say the story that follows and knowing that we were going to, I mean, I remember the story, but I just can't remember why did we do that beat in the minute, especially because the, the rest of the damn thing is <laughs> relatively tightly structured in the oh, sense totally. of, it's, it's so you know, tight. It just, like, I mean, kind of moves from beat to beat to beat to beat. Um, and that With was Iron and Gambit coming in there and you know, it was the nineties. So guest characters were, uh, yeah. Yeah. And we were there. definitely, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. We were, we were, um, we were playing with some of the same um not story rhythms but kind of structural rhythms of of fall from grace where we had yeah exactly you know where we had you know hey we had some guest stars they seemed to work out well you know and it also you know when you do a monthly comic you know there are certain tactical things that you're doing to to think about we're part of a larger universe you know, if you're if you're if you're just here, you know, you want other people to play with your toys and you want to be able to play with their toys, right? And other offices. So when you, you start to, and you know, you're part of a shared universe. So why wouldn't you want yeah. a character to kind of come in and feel like you're you're something, 
you know, and, and playing it out that way. Um, and, uh, and so that's, um, you know, and then there were a lot of seeds were being planted in that story for things that would, you know, we'd hope would, would come up later, but then obviously when creative teams got changed, um, then, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of yeah. the things we were setting up didn't, didn't come to, come to fruition or didn't, you know, take root as much as it would have, whether that was with Garrett or the way Electra got played out or the things with Karen or any of those things. Because elect the Karen had the subplot with the little girl in the in the video, the, right? The grainy that that I, that was never played out. I don't recall, was it? I don't I don't think it, it ever got picked up anymore after that. Uh, I think it because when I reread it, I was like, Ooh, this is, that was deep heavy. Yeah, no, that, it, may, it may have been too deep. I I, I question that in in hindsight. I, I think it was an interesting storyline to to play with her because of what had happened to her in her own background. Yes. Um, uh, and and again, it was definitely something that that connected with the awful uses of technology or the potential awful uses of technology. So um, uh, I I just don't know if it might have been again playing hindsight. You know, maybe it was like one thing too many for the story. I don't think it threw the story off. It didn't throw but the story. It, but, off. but it was definitely yeah. a, a kind of a dark thing. So, but I would have played with it more. And, and drawn it out more, but um, by that well, one, of the th one of the things I like about your Daredevil run was that you actually fo you focus on the other characters. You don't have Foggy as like you know the dumbass friend. Or no, Foggy Karen. was wicked smart. Fo Foggy, Foggy was and, and and you see that like in the series. I mean, my son would often joke like, I don't know if I want Murdoch for my lawyer, but I definitely want Foggy for my lawyer. You yes. know, I, I always love the the <laughs> one bit in a in Fall from Grace where. You know, Matt and him are having an argument, and, he, and Matt's ready to storm out. And you know, Foggy's like, "Oh, you forgot your cane," you know. And he's like, <laughs> you know, clearly kind of saying, you know, he's on to you, and he sort of knows what you know. You you think you're so clever and what's going on, but maybe not so much with this guy. But the earlier runs on Daredevil always portrayed Foggy kind of like, yeah, he, he, he could be he could be the, the bumpkin, kid. right? The goofy sidekick, right? <laughs> and then Karen didn't really have a past until she started doing her. Right. And then, but you know, that was, you know, Frank Miller did some extraordinary, well, did lots of extraordinary things, but certainly yeah. taking her out of the picture and then when you, you know, bringing her back in and suddenly this horrible situation, you know, had come, uh, you know, she had had to go through. Um, yeah. That's rich territory to explore. And, and, and it's, and it's going to be, uh, you know, it's, you you Just picked that. up little you picked up trends from the past that like no not, not a lot of other writers did. Yeah, I like doing that. I think that's yeah. that's the kind of thing that gives you the the you know the the moments to to build on and and uh, and not you know not be a slave to continuity, but it's it's the it's the aspects of a character that make it that make it more interesting. I mean, I'm a better writer now than I was then. I think and um, but those are things that. You know, if I could go back and give myself a little more advice, it'd be like, you could play that out a little bit more this way. But I was still trying. Like, I was still trying yeah. to play it out. What was the overall reception when it was over? Do you recall? You know, it wasn't as big as Fall from Grace. Um, I, I think, um, I don't think it was like Scott's favorite story. I, I think, I don't think he was, he was keen on the Karen subplot. You know, he did think that was too dark. And I wish we had talked more about that. Um, but, um, but I, uh, you, you know, I, I don't think it was, um, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a negative reaction to it, you, you know, but I, I think it was, um, I think it felt like the book was continuing on the path that we had set it, you know, in terms of energy and attitude, it felt very natural that, that we were continuing to build that energy. It felt like everything around that was you know, doing that. And then Electra was going to be the next part of that and, and so forth. But then, you know, monkey wrenches happen and, mm -hmm. You change, you change, you change direction. I love how Electra's hair just kept growing. <laughs> it's got to at some point, right? You know, she can't yeah. keep with the the bald, chaste look, you know, forever. But uh, yeah, but she, you know, the 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 all the seeds planted there, right? All the things with Electra in that story are things that we then were able to start bearing out in that Electra mini series with her. Root of Evil was it was the title, right? That was yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. See yeah. that. That escaped me, and I've never read it. It's a sad thing. I've never really? read that. Really? If you like this, Tom, and I'm not trying to get you to buy my back issues, but um, 
I would, I would, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a really good story. I think Was again, the story like, with uh, Snake Root. Yeah, the Snake Root. Like, yep. and then, and then, and then they've got to recover the power of their lost, you know. Yep. Uh, I, think sword. I, I think I read that story. I don't think I, I don't know if I still have it off the look, but I think I yeah. read that story. Long There's a lot of good, a lot of good ninja stuff in there. Yep. A lot of good, um, you know, a lot of good stuff with her. I mean, he Daryl makes a brief appearance, but but she's a. Uh, I I always felt that there was a lot of, I, th I guess that probably was the last time I worked with Scott, um, and not knowing it that at that time, um, but if if that had to be the last time you worked with somebody, that was a pretty good one to. To sort of cap things out on i i am gonna have to go uh i love the chase i'm gonna have to go look for it now yeah <laughs> well let me know how you do if uh if you if, if you come i can up find it, it i'll let you borrow it yeah cool. well you know is it is I'll it reprinted in something in I'm, I'm like i'm surprised they haven't uh i'm surprised they haven't like chugged it into one of these giant epic collections or something somewhere tree, but... tree never got collected in a trade did it no yeah, it's in this. It's in this new it's epic. It's in the new um, omnibus. Yeah, this new omnibus thing. You know, which, which actually, this shockingly, I'm like the first credit on this. Like, normally, like I'm like even even when it's my story, I'm usually like the fourth person. I was joking with Lee Weeks. They 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 published another one of these that leads with the fall of the kingpin story, and then Lee and I are actually like the fourth and fifth people on the. <laughs> <laughs> on the credit, which you know, I, I could care less, but it's just it just cracks me up. That is so wrong on so many levels because that was your stuff. Yeah, it's just, but it's just the way the credits, and they're not even alphabetical, so I don't know how they actually like choose. Like, why you know, why is it me, Greg? You know, why is Scott like number three? I, I don't know. So again, like this is Scott's illustration on the cover, right? So why is he the fourth person in the row? Doesn't matter. But, really but Tree never had its own trade like Fall from Grace. No, did. no, no, no. But even the Fall from Grace one, you know, Tom, we, you know, I think we talked last time. <clears throat> that was and that was a that was like a labor of love. Like we said, let's collect it. Let's get some, um, you know, let's uh, uh, let's get you know, let's take advantage of the extra attention. We added the extra story beat pages to tie things together. They uh, really did tie it together a lot. Yeah, and and yeah, they they were yeah those they were they were important little beats. They came out with that trade paperback, and then, to my knowledge, they have never come out with that trade paperback ever again. Right, I and, and I couldn't find it on. Wow. But you could find every other, you know, Daredevil fights, you know, the 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 Amazing Starfish trade paperback collection. You could find that one. You could not find Fall from Grace, you know, for love nor money. Um, uh, after that, as far as I know, so um, which I always I thought was just a. a what, what did I do? Who did I? Who did I? <laughs> piss off i i would joke you know <laughs> i found but, it i yeah. found it by by pure it's a, it's a nice it's a nice collection and his cover right. on that is awesome that just that stark yeah right exactly you've got the pose beautiful beautiful <laughs> stuff you did there. uh i just you know after tree of knowledge then came sadly the end of your run really Badness of humanity that greg did and then Right, and then, and then and then and then that other guy who was that other know, guy showed up, which we won't get into. But, but you but, know, I mean, listen, I'll, I'll you know clearly, you know, I, I joke forever. Like, I don't know who Al, I, I like Alan, but I don't talk to Alan much anymore. Right? Clearly, I wrote that story. Um, yeah, but I like I like talking to Dan. Alan, Alan's all right. <laughs> Alan's all right, and Alan, Alan, right. Alan, in retrospect, did a better job than I remember that Alan did, um, because I used to diss on Alan and because of the situation and I, you know, the reason I put Alan Smithy is on there is because of the situation of having been fired off the title kind of unceremoniously and, 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 but needing to finish those issues, right. Cause I was in the story and in my own head, I said, well, I'm in a bad mind frame. I'm not going to do a very good job with this story. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll be as professional as I can, but, in, in truth, I'm not going to do a great job with the story. The story is not going to go anywhere. Any of the seeds and things we're going to plant aren't going to bear fruit. So just like you weren't, Alan you, weren't the, you weren't dogging it, but you were kind of just like. Right. In some ways. And that's what, and then, the, you know, Alan Smithy is used by film directors to put on films that are taken yeah. away from them and that they think aren't going to turn out that way. But like recently, Gene Yarabar Yara is another one, isn't it? Is it? I haven't seen that one. Okay, I think that's so, a writing pseudonym. 
Oh, well, I should have used that one. But I That'd think I'm on Wiki. I, mean, I think I'm on Wikipedia as the only time Alan Smith has been used in, in comics is is in Daredevil. But uh, but recently, for one reason or another, I I went back and reread that story, and and I you know I finished it. And I actually called Greg afterwards, and I said, you know, the story's not the greatest, but it's actually pretty solid. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. even on autopilot of a sorts. You know, I, I clearly love the character and 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 wanted to do a good job. So, it, you know, it 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 still comes through. And even on that, like, uh, because Marie Javins was the the line editor, she was not the one who had who had given me the news, um, or or made the decision. But um, you know, I mean, they kind of they, they didn't even. I, I I just did whatever I wanted on that story. You know, I just I just wrote it and finished it and. But uh, my my biggest regret with it is that is that all the things we were setting up were not gonna you know we're not gonna bear fruit. So. Yeah, because then they went right back to the red costume, and yeah. then and then you know, uh, Mark yeah. Dematis came in and like he had him be insane for an issue, and and you know and Mark just needed to get out of my story and get into his story. So I yeah, I kind of I kind of I kind of tuned out on Daredevil around that time. Hmm. I was just I get know. I get why Mark did what he had to do, but yeah. Tree of knowledge. Tree of knowledge. No, it's a, it's a good, you know, the thing with the story, and I wish I could find it. I mean, it was one of my, my, uh, uh, a fun bit on that. Uh, and, and it was a bit I patted myself a little too much on the back for <laughs> was the Wired magazine. You know, I mentioned before. Yeah, you mentioned that when we were talking and, about and Yeah. And so I remember flipping through Wired magazine. It was the June, the January or the June 1995 issue. And um, it's all white cover. I remember that. And uh, I'm, I'm flipping through it. And, you know, they had articles and obviously long form articles, and a lot of little sidebar articles and reviews of things. And I'm reading this one little sidebar article and it's talking about there's this great story in comics and it's using all these technology edges and it's talking about line eaters and and uh, and, you know, it's it's kind of ahead of its time. And and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that sounds like a really great story. I should check that out. And then at the end of the article, and it's like and it's in the pages of Daredevil. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, like, holy shit, they're talking about my story. <laughs> yeah, the line eaters, which is kind of like an analogy. It was kind of like Big Brother, you know. It's all well. That was out. actually, and again, that was a, uh, yeah, exactly. That was the, yeah. the, but that was the the <laughs> line eaters again. These were all so many of those cool, unusual terms and titles and things were drawn from from real technology right the line info, eater was a was a thing you know I mean, infomorph was my favorite yeah i <laughs> infomorph was fun you know infomorph was, was my i, I liked it. wirehead you know that whole weird thing of living inside that 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 virtual reality thing you know was just so yeah. strange it, it was like in in some ways it was just shoving so many intriguing too many maybe deep intriguing characters into one story i could probably have like done a story with each of them as a villain <laughs> yeah, and then brought them all together as a team after the fact. That would but, be cool. Um, yeah. But, but a lot of the things that you were playing with are now real life things here in yeah. 2021. Yeah. To, to, yeah. Now, now if they came back, they would seem like they're, they're the CD ROM collection of, of, uh, you know, of, <laughs> of super villains because they've been supplanted by, you know, many, many real things, but, but they were they, they were definitely cool to, to play with and create. Uh, and, and did you have to go into it like a deep thing, like I can kill a bite and and all? I can't even name all of them off the top of my head. Techno spike, uh, steel yeah. collar, bitmap, uh, <laughs> wireheb, um, uh, kilobyte. You know, kilobyte. So Kilobyte dies right away. Well, kilobyte, kilobyte dies quick, yeah, because <laughs> um, his name was too obvious. But uh, yeah. you, had, you had to sacrifice somebody. Did I have to go deep, you mean, into who they were and what their descriptions were? And, and A little bit like with Scott with his... With oh, always, movie. yeah. I mean, give him, you know, you'd give him big... The origin story. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. What, is, what does this represent? You know, infomorph, you know... Uh, you know, shifts, you know, uh, of, you know, from the 2D plane to the 3D plane, you know, techno spike, what is his power? Steel collar is represents the big, you know, bull of the group. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wirehead's going to be in some kind of helmet and, and, and being able to like, uh, you know, move into these other uh, virtual realities and, and see things in this way. 
Yeah. But then, but then, it, you know, but then Scott takes those descriptions and my descriptions were, were, were detailed or, you know, this is, I think what we're going for, but you know, he, he would go and, and make those, make those sing. So, and I, I can't remember an instance where I went back and sort of said, Oh yeah, no, uh, that's not what I was thinking of for Infomorph because once you saw it, then that was her, right. Yeah. Or it was like, yeah, that's Infomorph, you know? So then you just, you just run with it. It must've been cool playing with Strucker though. And Hydra. Oh, I love Strucker. I love Strucker. This is, this is, you know, this is another killer thing. And I was talking to somebody about this, you know, recently, um, you know, we, we, and by we, I mean a handful of people, Greg was among them, Mark McLaurin, um, you know, a few others, you know, we treated Hydra seriously and we treated Strucker as like the badass of badasses and everybody else treated them like cannon fodder. Like, you know, they're a bunch mm -hmm. of yahoos and they run around in green smocks and, yeah. and such. And Strucker was a force to be reckoned with, know, man. He's, to be yeah, reckoned they with. Were, they were not the Great Lakes Avengers. They were, no. you know, either no. always badass. Yeah. And, and even, I mean, his whole plan, you know, and that's what I was sort of proud of. You know, his plan is just this ruthless weeding out of humanity. Right. He wants to set people against each other to basically say who survives is worthy of Hydra. Yeah. And everybody else is like it was using fodder. it was and, like using technology for fear. Right. And it's not about like we're using it to, you know, he, he had a mission and his mission was pure. And in, in, in that, you know, certainly drawing from, you know, while we didn't get into the, the Nazism of his background there, he was kind of past that in a way. But his 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 supreme race you know was was, was the inherent yeah that was the inherent drive now his pure you know in my mind his his supreme race could have been anybody who measures up but you have to measure up you know you have to be you have to pass the ruthless survivor on. right so yeah. but that could have been any creed or stink skin color or whatever um but yeah i, I he was just a joy to work with when he showed up in Avengers, uh, you know, the movie, I was kind of hoping a little bit more, you know, out of Strucker, you know, just to see if they were going to play with any, any things at all. But, um, yeah. uh, he may be gone for all time. I think he's gone for all time. We have a dog on the camera now. Hi, a dog. What's the dog's Nova name? <laughs> What's his name? Nova. Nova. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Richard Ryder, Nova. <laughs> no. I know. Nope. Yes. Well, Bill, it's actually seven thirteen right now. I know you said you wanted to know what time it was. Oh, yeah. oh okay. All right. You you signing off, pal? Yeah, I'm gonna head out. Okay, we can end it here. I mean, we kind of covered Tree of Knowledge and yes, uh, great. good I, conversation. I enjoy Tree of Knowledge immensely. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you both for being, you know, uh, fans of the work and a chance to talk about it. It's always fun. My last thing I will say is, as you said, Dan, when we talked about this previous, previously, <laughs> how it how it almost became symbolic of what ended up happening, and I just think it, not not intentional at the time, Tom. But no, yes, it, it's but that, of, that's a good one too. I like that one. I love yeah. it. Yeah, there were some. There were some. He did some striking covers on there. The only the only cover, and it's not that I don't like the cover, um, because I do, but it's sort of the it, the balance of it was the cap cover. I thought it was a little like cap was so large on that cover that I, I wasn't ever clear. Yeah. It's like Daredevil almost like vanishes into his own book. And it, it almost it, looks like, he almost looks like Rob Liefeld's Captain America where he looks just yeah. huge. Yeah. And that might've been an instance where Scott and I needed to, you know, chat more and, and maybe find a, you know, something that he was, he was, you know, looking for in terms of what are the things we need to represent here. So, yeah, but, but sometimes he was also working a lot with Pat Garrahy at that point. And Pat would have some, you know, ideas about striking singular visuals that could, um, you know, draw attention on the stands as opposed to what's going on in the book, right? You know, you know, the interesting thing about that particular issue was the system of error issue was like how Scotty drew even Submariner in that little prologue about how New York was kind of going yeah. into crappy. I just I because it had been a long time since I had read that particular issue. Seeing, you know, Submariner in the green underwear and Galactus all shadowy yeah. and it was yeah, just yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it makes you hungry for somebody like Scott to then play with more of that, right? Yeah. You know, even so the way he drew even the way he drew Black Knight just kind of looking like a looks like a douche in the issue, just kind of <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, at that level they were a little douchey, you know, except for Cap. Um except for Cap. You know, because he <laughs> He's, he's a nice guy. Um, we, brought, we had a couple of comments. We had a hi, what's up, Tom? Dunzilla's back and a blank one from Keith Bodine. So that's the oh. best comment I think we ever got. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you guys a question. Absolutely. Um, so uh, what what was the read um, on uh, the four-hour Justice League from your points of view? You know, I have not watched it in its entirety yet because I was not going <laughs> to get HBO Max just to watch that movie. Okay, that's I'm, I might wait for the blue ring, but I'm gonna. Yeah. I've seen enough and I've read enough about what Snyder was actually able to put in, and I, I admit mm -hmm. I've watched some of the clips on YouTube. Uh, I did not like Justice League that came out in 2017. I, I right. it, you know, to me, it had a Superman 4 feel where you could just mm -hmm. tell oh, God. It was a totally <laughs> incomplete, it was a totally incomplete film, rushed really, you know, that forced mm -hmm. CGI and. We won't get into mustache gate, but I just, I just, I like what I saw from the Snyder cut. I don't know about the four hour length, but I mean, if he was given the chance to do what he wanted to do, because there may not be a justice league two or whatever. I right. think DC, yep. DC obviously is, uh, they basically tried to jump out of a trunk and play catch up with Marvel. Yep. That's a good way of looking That's at true. it. Yeah. I heard an analogy and I said this to Dunn, many years ago, well, I shouldn't say many, more like four, it was like what they tried to do. To me, it just seemed like, and I'm not knocking DC, because I love the DC films. Mm -hmm. It went Man of Steel, Dawn of Justice, and then Justice League. And to me, that struck me almost as if it was Iron Man 1, Cap Civil War, Avengers. Oh, yeah. No, it was def definitely, definitely uh, yeah. no consistency or build you know, between it, right? You know, yeah. everyone forgets that, you know, Iron Man coming out, whatever it was, 2008, 2000. May 2nd, 08. I remember that you know. day like it was yesterday. But, but that was a, a third, second tier character at best, right? Yep. Not um, an actor who the film company, you know, did not want in the movie. And right? because, because he was a risk, you know, he was known as being, you know, a heroin addict and a, and a, you know, in a, in a, and a risk, talented, but you know they couldn't even get insurance on him. I think and, to get a movie. He was an insurance risk. Yeah, yeah. he was. A and, and the he director had done a couple of nice things, but nothing of, <laughs> you know, not not the not the formula you think is like going to launch. You know, the a next twelve dollars. years, yeah, of, oh. of filmmaking. You know, in that way. So, but you never know where what, stuff comes out of. What did you think of it? You saw it. I saw your post on. Facebook. I did. I did. I, I I'm. I don't want to be smirchy because I would really be interested when you guys do see the whole thing, what you think of it. I, I did not care for it, um, I, you know, and for many storytelling reasons. I'll, I'll put it that way. But I, I don't want to get into um, into the, it. You know. The spine of the movie is still the same. There's no... Yeah, in, es yeah, in essence, it, yeah. I mean, in essence, it's like, yeah, the, the basic, es you know, Batman is trying to get together a group because something awful is going to happen. Mm -hmm. There are mother boxes, you know, or infinity stones or mother boxes or whatever they are, and uh, <laughs> which have to be gathered up. Um, and then, you know, they have to defeat Steppenwolf before before that happens. So, yes, in essence, the same movie in that way. But um, some differences, a lot of detours, um, extensions of other things. But it's not like it's a completely different movie plot wise. But um, uh but I didn't think the first one was that. As I said to somebody, um, I think Howard Mackey, it's like I, 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 I almost completely forgot Justice League. You know, you, you'd you'd be hard pressed to tell me the first the first time out. You'd be hard yeah. pressed to tell me, or me to tell you, what happened in that movie. You, give give me a quotable line. Give me this. Give me that moment that made you go like, oh, wow, holy shit. I think everyone you know, forgot about that cut. What's that? We, I think everyone forgot about that. that yeah, but I'm the, starting the, to forget this one. I'm, I remember this one more because of the things that. Oh my god! I'm, I mean, it took me three days to watch it. You know, first off, you know, because it was, <laughs> it, it was, and then it also came right before, right on the heels of 
of a uh, you know the Falcon, the Winter Soldier, which is just to me another kickoff point for some more great storytelling and filmmaking. Well, so to me, it's suffering in comparison as well. But if, if I can say, when we saw Don and I saw Justice League, I'll go. We actually got a couple of comments since you mentioned Justice League. But oh, when we saw the two thousand, the Justice League, as some are calling it online. <laughs> The only thing I remember Justice on the, the Justice League, I just remember they had turned Batman campy with the one like, oh, something's bleeding. I just hated it because, you know, I grew up a Batman fan. Right. But but I will admit this. If, if we get it on Blu-ray, if I get it on Blu-ray, I am going to try to watch it uninterrupted. And I'm going to I'm going to do my I'm going to do my yep. damnedest. Right. It's yep. like, you know, I'm take a whole Saturday just to watch it. It might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might it might seem like more than that. By the I know by hour two, I'm gonna be like that. <laughs> you know, some movies cook, right? Some movies, some movies, yeah. you're you you never know that the time has gone by, and and um and some things can be half as long as that movie and and drag right. forever. Feel day. forever. Feel like yeah. it's forever. Yeah. Like Endgame. Yeah. Yes. So you didn't you, you, that that didn't work for you, Don? See. <sighs> Yeah. See that to me that we worked. Both, I, I, me and Tom both did not like Endgame. Okay. Yeah, then be interested to see what you like think of this. It was. I didn't so, like it. I didn't. Go ahead. Doug, it was sorry, so boring. <laughs> okay. Was so, to me, it was just so boring. Everyone was just crying for like the first two hours of the movie. And Interesting. <laughs> okay. The whole time travel thing just did not make sense. Yeah, time travel. Well, you got. I got a big problem when you diss Back to the Future. Um, you know that that to me is sort of like you you're you're, it, you're getting pretty close to losing yeah, it. Yes, it's, it's exactly. back to the future. So they, they tried to take what Back though. to the Future did and make it better, and they just totally fucked it up. <laughs> yeah, but they they also like said you know oh, it doesn't but Back to the Future is bullshit. You know, it's like it was a funny line, but it was. Um, but it was like eh. time 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 movie logic wise, it's it's pretty tight. You know, Back to the Future is pretty tight, so you can't beat it in regard to the time travel. The whole movie. trilogy was perfect. The whole what? The whole Back to the Future trilogy was just yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, it really, perfect. yeah, it really, it really syncs up extraordinarily. I mean, yeah, well. it has flaws, you know, minor flaws, but you, know. mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you remember that 80s, one night? Nineties, it was awesome. <laughs> you remember that one night? I completely, maybe after a few adult beverages, I found every logical flaw with Back to the Future three. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There are a few, you know, but Back to the Future Three is is. I was like, meat. wait a minute, how can Doc fall in love with someone that he hasn't met yet? He saved her, but the only reason he saved her was because Marty wasn't there. But Marty wasn't there, and then like it just turned into like this whole yeah, starts yeah, to, starts to burn your. I think brain it was out. like a three hour conversation we had. It it was a three hour conversation <laughs> from my brain about why Back to the Future Three worked and how the filmmakers avoided running into the the trap of time travel movies. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's not crap, and I love I love Back to the Future. Yeah. No, but it's it's got uh, yeah, you can get into some logic loops with any time travel movie. But the the further you go out from the first one, which again was so tight, the second one also works really well. But the further the you get one, out, the second one worked. I feel like because they used all three different time periods as an act. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. It was, and, and that was like the perfect that was the perfect way to tell it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You're not gonna believe this. We're not. We gotta go back to 1955. Right. I don't believe it. And then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they go right into the third act, going back to 1955. Yep. So Let's here see. are the comments we got. Uh, we got. We got Tuesday, our sponsor from Tasty with Tuesday. She says, "Hey guys, the Big Blue Boy Scout cast a big shadow. You can't hate on that." Yeah, he is. I'm assuming she's talking about Robert Downey when we were talking about his past and his casting. She then says, "Confession. I think Iron Man is meh." A lot of people did. A lot of people thought Iron Man was meh before the, the first. Film. The first movie, yes. I See, thought I thought all three of them were just meh. Yeah, interesting. This the first one to me was because I didn't see it in the theater. Right, I figured it was going to be meh. So that could be for me. It worked differently because by the time I finally saw it, it was like, holy shit, that was pretty good. So yeah, sometimes that's the way it works. See, I thought I see for me in Iron Man. Iron Man one is good. I love Iron Man one. I confess that two is pretty. Two, two to me is mad. Two has some great yeah. moments. Yeah, I mean, two has some great moments. Anything where pretty... Mickey Rourke is chewing scenery is three was is pretty... too trash. Three was trash to me. Three was garbage. See, three, was in, three I didn't like as much on the first viewing, but I saw it again because it's on on Disney and I can watch it. Um, uh, it improved 
especially once I got past the whole uh, Ben Kingsley thing, you know, where I could never like, get over that. I desperately wanted him to actually be the, the villain. And then yeah. when he turns yeah. out to be this Yahoo, I was like, wait a minute. But then yeah. uh, leaning more into it, I, I've come to appreciate that more and realize for me, at least it makes the Tony Stark story, you know, more interesting, but that's to, you me, know, to, my, me, my to me it was just i did not like it and it wasn't like because of the ben kingsley thing just killed it i mm -hmm. was like well, and then you know you got guy <laughs> pierce going i am the mandarin i was just sort of like yeah he was nowhere and he's not and he's and he's nowhere near yeah. as as strong as ben kingsley because ben kingsley right. just owned the moments and then you're buying into that and then when you get to that revelation wait a minute you're just a schmuck and and yeah. you know it, it yeah. if you're when you to me at least again that I remember feeling deflated in the movie, but then seeing it again, I appreciate I appreciate the whatever you want to call it storytelling jujitsu more. But it, it's but just all a lot of Shane Black motifs though, you know. Oh, absolutely, whole, it's a very Shane oh, Black. Movie. It's completely it's, Shane Black. Movie. It's all Shane Black, and it just it yeah. It it just didn't seem like to me the good follow up to Justice Justice League Joss Justice Whedon's League. version of Justice League Joss Whedon's <laughs> Avengers, which I am actually a fan of Joss Whedon's Avengers. I actually don't. Oh, I actually Avengers. think that's his best movie. Yeah, it, it, Avengers is pretty is pretty uh, is pretty sharp. Holds up really well. And just great moments and and uh, seems so small in comparison to other things now. But uh, and, but at the time was enormous you know in terms of like what are we seeing we're seeing we're seeing helicarriers we're seeing we're seeing like you know yes. we're seeing all these characters in one place and all those characters were five characters right six characters yeah you know at the, the most that seemed like enormous you know we saw avengers opening night done and I, it yeah, was so pretty I. good yeah, yeah. No, i was completely blown yeah. away by it and and you know it's it's as a i my own enthusiasm you know was one thing but it was also a perfect age for my I saw with my kid, which I highly recommend, you know, sometimes if you have that chance, to, you know, whether you have kids of your own, you can take somebody because when you see it through their eyes as well, it's like it, it turbocharges the whole thing. So my only pretty... complaint with Avengers one was they cut a lot of the good cap cap Captain America character moments out mm -hmm. from that where... had been in the film. I, I didn't like where their outtakes. I never saw any of that. There, stuff. Were, there was a deleted subplot with cap basically readjusting to, 2012 or 2013, whatever year. Oh, I heard it. about that, where he's like hanging out and yeah. going like through the files of his old soldiers yeah. and struggling yeah. to talk to a waitress. And it's actually got a nice little Stan Lee cameo where she said, uh, the waitress goes, we have free Wi-Fi. He goes, radio? And then she turns and smiles and then the, the Captain Stan Lee just goes, ask for, ask for her number, you moron. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that was my oh, one. Oh, better than the movie. What's that? That's just me. <laughs> what did you like better in the movie? The first two Avengers movies, I thought the post credit scenes were better than the entire movie. Wow. Oh, that's harsh. <laughs> that's um you may, you know, what well, well, that's it. We're gonna we gotta we gotta check back in when uh, you guys see Justice League because I want to hear Absolutely. I heard I heard there's gonna be a I heard there's gonna be a black and white version. There is, it's already out. It's on it's on I mean if you have HBO or whatever, HBO Max, but I couldn't I on the I could spend a full other hour dissing on it, and I will not do that uh, in deference to you guys. But I, I would not, I would not return to want to watch a black and white version of an already heavily desaturated movie. I'll say that. And, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> I like that. I actually like that description. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, listen, gents, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Yes. Call, um, this has been great. Uh, Always great talking to you, Dan. I love it. Uh, we'll talk in the future. Come back. We'll talk about another story, and then we can do Justice League. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Absolutely. All right. All right. A shout out to Tasty with Tuesday, game uh, proud sponsor, of Bad for Your Health Entertainment for Dunzilla, Dan Chichester. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Take care. Be well. Bye bye. Yeah.